Well, good evening. <clears throat> Welcome to Freedom of Christ. This is Monday Night Live. God bless you for tuning in. I'm Neil Anderson. You know me, and this is Matt Massengale. We Massengale. haven't been saying his last name. <clears throat> his daughter says, come on, Dad, let him know who you are. So uh, <laughs> uh, this is our last um, episode on, on anger. If you, Just to recap just a little bit. Uh, there's one issue about dealing with anger on a daily kind of a basis, things that tick us off. And uh, we try to encourage you to realize that's really just a battle for your mind. And, uh, and Satan can get in there and give you thoughts and you, it can make you angry as well. And so that's part of the whole uh, problem that we have. And so, you know, if you manage your anger then presently by essentially managing your thought life. But it's a little bit more than that because you also have uh, mental strongholds, the flesh patterns that have been, you know, grooved into our mind from years past. And we got to crucify those. I mean, that's our responsibility to say that's not going to continue on in my life. But actually, one of the major issues, uh, not for people getting angry, but for angry people, is to deal with what I call anger wounds. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, Matt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, unforgiveness is a big part of this. And I was talking with a young lady back oh, several years ago who had been date raped and just could not get over it, couldn't forgive, couldn't move on with her life, uh, actually tried to control everybody that she dated. Uh, she had just decided that, you know, I'm never gonna be taken advantage of like that again. I will be the one that would be in control of the situations. Yeah. And it just ruined her life. Yeah. It just was uh, wreaked havoc on everybody that she was around, including herself. But she was able to forgive and went on and got married and just living a very normal life. Just, it's like it just changed from night to day when she forgave. Uh, you know, I, uh, we have a training video that we use where a girl comes in clinically depressed and leaves, you know, free. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually kind of happy. And uh, we've used that in the past as a training tool. Uh, but the anger that is there can just be dissipated and it all comes back to just mm -hmm. forgiving. And, uh, and that's such a huge issue. I, I mean, in all, is. all of our ministries around the world, everybody just keeps reporting back. I said, what is the big issue? It's on forgiveness. It's on forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And so we keep repeating that again and again and again. But uh, it's just so important for ourselves. And it's also important to realize, I said, you don't forgive that person for their sake. You do it for your sake. It's really an issue between you and God. And let me just clarify that as we, as we think about this because... Uh, a lot of people come to this issue of forgive and they feel, boy, I got to go see him. I said, that's actually not true. Uh, now, let's make a separate issue because they're two different issues entirely. The Bible says if you know that your brother has something against you, leave your offering to church and go be reconciled. In other words, if you've offended somebody else, essentially, oh, I'll always go to God, but, but don't go to church to resolve that. Go to that person. Seek their forgiveness and make retribution if it's necessary. That's not what we're talking about tonight. It could include the same two people, but it's a different issue. If you've been hurt, go to God. It's really an issue between you and God. If you think about it, uh, that has to happen because truth of the matter is, some of these people that have offended you could have died and whatever else. So it's right. still an ongoing battle within your own life. It's, it's between you and God. That's why I can sit down in my office with somebody and help them you know, forget people in their past and watch them walk out free and nothing to do with the other person. So uh, please keep that in mind. And also keep in mind the fact that I'm not going to forgive them because they never asked me for it. I said, every sick person in the world can hold you hostage in the rest of your life. Sure. And so if you're waiting on them to come to you, that may never happen. And, and I, you know, this is painful to even share this, but truth of the matter is there's all kinds of people who are just waiting for that person to come and uh, make retribution and make amends. I said, but what if they never do? What if that mother or dad never come back and ask forgiveness or said they're sorry? What if they never did? Right. Uh, uh, you know, you're going to stay in bondage and bitterness the rest of your life? You can't make your freedom and your life dependent upon somebody else you can't control. It just won't work. So, Is there ever a time where it's appropriate to go in person if you the one that's been offended? The only time I can think, to be honest with you, is if they actually came and asked you for it. 
Mm-hmm. Because they they understand now it's an issue between you and me, right? And uh, and I've then seen, you, I've seen people do that, and the other person didn't even know they had offended them, and it creates a bigger problem. Yeah, you got to be careful about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like, Don't walk up to somebody and just simply say, "I just want you to know I've forgiven you," and and especially if they don't even know there's been an issue there. Right. But if they've asked you, then you have some obligation to respond to them. And I hope it's yes, I, I do forgive you. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me share. A, a couple of stories along this line. When I first moved here to Franklin, I went to some prayer group downtown Nashville, and and uh, two guys actually came up to me and said, uh, "There's a lady who's just dying to meet you," and uh, I said, "I'm married," <laughs> and they said, uh, "No, no, it's not that." So, uh, I said, "Well, sure, that'd be fine with me." And nothing happened for about three months. And then I got a call from this guy saying she's actually flying uh, into town, is going to spend the night at our house. Can we get together? She really wants to meet you. I said, sure, great. Well, she was introduced to me in this way. Hitler was her godfather. Oh, Hitler, the Hitler. And so obviously, leading a statement, I'm kind of curious how that came about, where her dad was a, um, a top military general in Hitler's army uh, back in the late 30s. And uh, uh, he was also a strong Lutheran believer. And when he saw anti-Semitism begin to rise and be part of the, uh, the whole German thing, uh, he started to speak out against it. Gestapo came to his house mm-hmm. and, uh, and offered him a pill. If he took the pill, officially, he died of a heart attack. If he didn't, he had been shot, his family would be disgraced. And, uh, but for the sake of his family, he took the pill. Oh and uh, she actually never knew about that initially, but because of his prominent position, etc. in the past, they were taken care of all during the Second World War, whatever else. But that actually wasn't her trauma. Uh, the, the thing she struggled with was the Russians who came in and pillaged and plundered and raped and I mean just, I mean, they basically somehow, because probably of the past high position, were able to flee to Sweden to, to mm. get away from the persecution. Mm. And uh, she literally, had this terrible bitterness and hatred towards them. And uh, so I'm hearing her tell me this story. In Sweden, she came to Christ. Now she's struggling with this issue to forgive. But the real reason wasn't for me to help her. She came to tell me that she has been for 10 years using our material in Ukraine. Oh, wow. (laughs) Folks, if that isn't the power of God, the people that she hated before, she has now been called to minister to. And uh, I had a a prof friend who did an interesting thing in class. Everybody's been been abused, and and usually that leaves a lot of what I call anger wounds. Mm -hmm. Wounded people. Mm -hmm. And like I said last week, wounds that aren't healed or transferred. We bounce off each other's wounds and uh, it disrupts, disrupts ministries, families, and, and it can go on for generations, actually. And uh, so this one particular class, you know, he's, he was trying to bring out this idea, what do you do with that kind of an anger? And so what he did was he uh, had a sheet up on the wall over there and he said, I want you to just kind of get rid of that. And they said, just take that dart and think it's that person and just throw it at him. <laughs> it's kind of like the old anger management stuff, pound on the pillow or, you know, just get rid of your anger and whatever else. And so one by one, they all did it and said the person's name and threw the darts at the thing. And after everybody was done, he went up and took off the sheet and behind it was a picture of Christ. And the oh, caption wow. said, the things that you've done to the least of my brother and you've done to me. <laughs> that, would, that would be a tough lesson to work through, wouldn't it? It's, um, mm. So where are we going with this? Well, in light of that, I think let's set it up by looking at this passage in Matthew 18 about the unforgiving servant. It's and, a, yeah, it's something I've covered before, but Peter comes to Jesus and said, you know, how many times should I forgive? Up to seven times. The Lord says up to 70 times seven. And he's not suggesting you keep a pocket calculator and take off 490 and then pull out a gun and shoot the bomb. The (laughs) idea is is that you continue to forgive. Mm -hmm. And it's it's an ongoing process in our life. I I coined a little term recently that I just can't get out of my mind. And I think it's really, really true. I said, patience is forgiving at the moment. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, if, if we have that ability, and I think it's part of our maturing process, and it will help you drive in your car too, <laughs> when the person in front of you doesn't go too fast, That's and right. said, patience is forgiven at the moment. But we don't always do that, and so we, the anger kind of persists. <clears throat> but to illustrate that, the Lord gave a parable, and there was a man who owned his master 10,000 talents. Now, that is way beyond a lifetime wage. And, and the point of the parable is to teach Millions. that it, yeah, yeah. It's, it's unpayable. Right. Repayment is not an option. And, of course, what we're referring to here is our own personal relationship with God. There is no way that I'm going to work for my salvation or pay off the debt that, that I owe God. There's no way I can live a righteous life in order to accomplish that. It's impossible. And so he cried for mercy and said, Lord, have mercy upon me. I mean, I can't repay this, so the only thing I can ask for which brings up three very important issues, justice, mercy, and grace. Justice is rightness, fairness. I mean, within all of us, um, there's always that cry for justice. I mean, and that's legitimate. I mean, that's not illegitimate. That, sure. That's a legitimate sure. thing. And, uh, <clears throat> but I always have to tell people, I said, can we just settle something right now for your sake? I said, I want justice now. But people, you will never have perfect justice in this lifetime. Right. You look at some of the high-profile cases, O.J. Simpson and places like that, and what's going on in Washington, the impeachment and all those kind of things, and, and you just, you, you just kind of cringe yeah. for justice. But you will never have perfect justice in this lifetime. Uh, you know, that's why the Lord said, revenge is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. There is a final judgment that is coming. I just talked with one of our ministry associates just this last weekend, and he told me a horrible story of his own niece, you know, killing his mother, killing his brother. They couldn't prove it, uh, embezzled funds and whatever else, and, and, uh, and finally he just kind of chased her out of the country. But he said it just kind of recycles. Your emotions kind of recycle. Mm -hmm. You come back to the anger of that and the, and the frustration of it. And, uh, but truth of the matter is, he may never see justice in this lifetime. Right. And that's why the board says, revenge is mine. Justice will come. That, that's a, a trust that we have to give to God. He will make this right in the end. And a key thing on that we were talking about before we started is that I want justice for other people, but I want mercy for me. Yeah. <laughs> well, but see, justice is rightness of fairness. If God gave us what we deserve right now, we would all get hell. That's right. Settle that right now. I mean, because that's where that's where this parable is coming from. We owe 10,000 talents way beyond lifetime wage. Somebody else has offended us. It's a denarii. It's a day's wage kind of a thing. And so the Lord had mercy on him. Now, mercy, you throw yourself upon the mercy of the court. You're basically saying, I did it, but please don't give me what I deserve. And that's really what mercy is. And we are saved not by deeds done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. So God didn't want to. God could not be unjust. He can't say, okay, I'll, you know, I'll give you mercy and then I'll bypass this justice thing. No, justice had to be served. That's what the cross is all about. Christ died once for all. And uh, he took that penalty that we deserved upon himself. That's That's the grace of God. But mercy is not giving people what they deserve. Grace is a little different. It's actually giving people what they don't deserve. Now, everything we have in terms of our relationship with God is what we're to live out. Um, uh, don't give people what they deserve, but have mercy. And give them what they don't deserve is the next step. Love one another. And so, I mean, this is a powerful thing. This, this is the everything to do with the cross because... Freely I have received, freely I give. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to see the disproportionate nature of that. I have received infinite amount of, of grace, more than I've ever been able to give. Right. We love because he first loved us. The love of God is what I'm learning to do to others, but I can't even give you know, what God has given me in terms of his love. And, and so anyway, the parable didn't end there. Then the guy went out, and a uh, guy came to him and demanded. He, that same guy went out and demanded somebody else to repay him. A uh, hundred denarii. That's yeah, a day's, day's <laughs> wage. Yeah, it's a small amount. It's not trivial. I think it, it would cost about six months or something like that of wages. But he wouldn't forgive him. And uh, 
So he was going to throw him into the debtor's prison and whatever else. And then the master came back, you wicked slave. Now listen to that, wicked slave. Wicked slave. That sounds kind of harsh, doesn't it? But, you know, that's kind of where the heart of our God is. I forgave you, you should forgive others. We're to forgive others as Christ has forgiven us. And uh, He said in anger, he turned him over to the tormentors. To the tormentors. To the and, um, and it's important to realize something. I mean, your translation may say jailers. Yeah which would be kind of in keeping with the terminology of the parable. However, the word itself is the same word that Jesus used uh, in interacting with demons when the demons said, why are you tormenting us? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's the same word. And, and that's not to be pie pass for a moment, because in 2 Corinthians 2, he says, we are not ignorant of Satan's schemes. Uh, the whole context there is an encouragement for that church to forgive somebody who would embarrass them or whatever else. And, and uh, those schemes, that tormenting, is what you are experiencing at night when, when the injustice of this uh, hits you and, and the anger and you wake up at night thinking about somebody in your past or probably all day long or, you know, your life or it comes back to you now and again. That's a disciplinary thing. Don't think of this as God punishing me. Gosh, I've already been hurt. Now God is punishing me. Discipline is superintending future choices. It's a proof of God's love for us. He doesn't want us to live in bitterness. And, and, uh, and nor does anybody else for that matter. They just don't know how to get rid of that. He's bringing it up so we deal with it. Yep. We can't, you know, that's another thing that as we're talking about this, the two things that have to happen is that you have to reprocess things that's happened to you in these, in these past, you know, these areas of pain. As an unbeliever, I can't deal with it. I don't have the ability to, to deal with it. As an, as an immature believer, I don't have it. But if I can process it as a believer with a new identity in Christ, I can look at it differently and not as a victim, but as somebody that says, I can leave this up to God and he will make it right in the end. Yeah, when we discussed emotions in one of my earlier sets, I said, you know, how are we freed from our past? I mean, we, we have all these past experiences. We've been wounded, we've been hurt, and then something comes along and triggers it, and out comes what I call a primary emotion. Right. And uh, you know, I have almost no control over that either. Uh, the only control you have is I'm not going there. If that person's there, I'm not going to watch that movie because it brings right. up these thoughts, and I don't want to discuss this issue. And, and so your life can shut down if you've had a lot of abuse in your past. And so how do we set ourselves free from that? I said, well, you can't by yourself, but you, dear believer, are not a product of your past. You're a product of the work of Christ on the cross. At that time you were hurt, you processed that. And probably what happened was, because I've said this time again, and I just want to remind you, you are not in bondage to that past trauma. You're in bondage to the lies you believe because of the trauma. That's an important important part. Well, it's really key because you processed at that time. Right. You, you just, you feel the woundedness of it. You've been hurt. The injustice of it stinks. You know, you, you are, you're a victim. Well, in the vow that you make that that's never going to happen to me again, that's not made with God. Yeah. And, uh, no, that's not. It's a false vow. And, uh, so, you know, we're a new creation in Christ. I said, you can process that now, not as a victim anymore. I can't promise you, you're not going to be victimized. I can promise you, you don't have to remain a victim. Right. And th that's so embedded into the gospel and what it really means to be a child of God. And so I can look at that again. We don't want to because when I look at it, it triggers it up. All the emotion comes with it. That's not wrong. That's giving you the ability to forgive from your heart. Neil, I've seen when I've asked people to go through forgiveness and going through the steps, they can say, you know, I forgive my dad, I forgive my mom. But when I ask them to really feel the pain of what happened and, and talk about it, it's a totally different thing. You've got to acknowledge the pain and the hurt that happened with it to truly forgive. Yeah, well, the way we help them do that, it, and, and it's a very difficult thing, it, it, uh, to help people really, truly get in touch with the inner core of their life. Mm -hmm. It's not just a seed of emotions. It's a seed of reflection and thinking about it and justice of it. And, uh, but... Uh, the way we try to help them do that is what did you forgive them for? Because people will say, well, I forgave my dad 10 years ago. What did you forgive him for? Things he did. What did he do? I don't want to talk about it. Right. You know, they, they haven't really dealt with the issue. And so what we encourage people to do is just pray and ask God, who is it that I need to forgive? And the obvious ones will come out 
instantly almost. But there will probably be a few others that almost will surprise you if you really mm -hmm. trust in God. Mm -hmm. And uh, then <clears throat> with each one, Lord, I forgive us. It's a crisis of the will. Don't say, I, I want to. That's why I pass it. Don't say, God help me. God will help you. I promise, right. you, promise me. Right. It, it needs to be you saying, I forgive and what for. It's in the what for. And we find it very helpful to people just to add a little tagline because it made me feel rejected, unloved, shameful, you know. True. Or, that's and, when the emotion usually happens. And, 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 and we're not just trying to make people cry. Right. I mean, that's the issue. And by the way, you know, temperaments are different. I remember this, this one lady uh, had quite a list of people she needed to forgive, and she just toughed her way all the way through it. Mm -hmm. I never really saw a tear, but boy, she was working on it, and it was very, very hard for her. But that was more like her nature. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some people when you announce good news, they just, you know, fly apart, you know. And others kind of, mm, that's good, you know. And my wife used to cry. <laughs> you know? I mean, so we have that, that, that gamut. But you can kind of tell whether or not I'm getting down to the core of this issue. And, and, and just and stay with that till I remember pain. And by the way, on that list, better include yourself. Only God can forgive you in terms of your relationship with him. But in, in forgiving yourself, I found it incredibly helpful uh, because what it does is it forces you to look at all this self-talk where you've been beating yourself up for years mm -hmm. to let yourself off the hook. And that's what some people are asking right now. You say, these people really hurt me. You don't know how bad they hurt me. I said, they're still hurting you. But why should I let them off my hook? That's exactly why. You're still hooked to them. They're still hurting you. They're still hurting you. I said, you let them off your hook. Are they off God's hook? Right. No. Revenge right. is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. What is forgiveness? If you're going to forgive as Christ has forgiven you, what did he do? He took my sin upon himself. So essentially what you're saying is, I'm agreeing to live with the consequences of that person's sin. And you say, well, that's not fair. Actually, you're right. It isn't. But you'll have to anyhow. There's not one person living right now who hasn't been hurt, who isn't living with the consequences of somebody else's sin. That's right. You can either do that in the bondage of bitterness or the freedom of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying and hoping for, that there will come a point where you will let that go. And just let it go. And that is never forgotten. A lot of people think they haven't forgiven because they haven't forgotten. That's no. too, that doesn't go away, though. It's very important to make that distinction because God doesn't forgive. You say, well, the Bible says, I'll remember your sin no more. Uh, that is actually true. But that word is the same word in Greek that we get our word uh, amnesia from. And uh, it's actually the same word that we use in our communion table. Do this in remembrance of me. Hmm. Do you know what that actually means? <laughs> it's kind of fascinating. It means that what, what happened with Christ in his life and his death and his burial and a resurrection, apply that to you today. But when you put an A or an alpha in front of the word, it reverses the meaning. And what he means when he says, I'll remember your sin no more, is I will put it away from me as far as the east is to the west. I will not use the past against you. Yeah. But when you come to communion, it's take the past that I accomplished for you and apply it to your life today. Wow. So when you say to somebody two years ago you did this, you have just said, I haven't forgiven you. I'm still throwing the past against you. And if you do that and continue to do it in your marriages, you're going to have Ooh. problems, problems, problems. Remember when it's not a good beginning yeah. to a sentence. <laughs> you know, when you did this two years ago, <laughs> no, don't start out that way because you may never recover from it. And, uh, I, you know, I think another point while we're on that deal before we move on is forgiveness is not necessarily reconciliation. They're two very different things. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men, but it doesn't always depend upon you. Right. It is now possible. If that person doesn't want to be reconciled with you, you're not going to be reconciled. Uh, or if somebody's abused you, you're not going to be reconciled with that person. But if you've forgiven that person... You've asked their forgiveness. That's all God requires of you. Right. They won't reciprocate it. Get on with your life. Right. And uh, get on with your life. Let God deal with that person. Uh, you have no other choice. Uh, if you sit there the rest of your life and say, you know, I screwed up somehow or another. Mm -hmm. and we're not reconciled. 
There are people out there who just are not going to cooperate with you in that regard. And you're not going to let that person determine who you are. Are you? <laughs> you know, this is, this is the beautiful part, I think, of our message, Matt, mm -hmm. is that I am free to be the person God created me to be, and I'm not going to let that sick person or sad person or whoever it is out there determine who I am. And uh, when you have enough maturity to say that, you really are a liberated person. I mean... It, uh, I, met, I was down doing a conference somewhere in the South, and uh, when I was a, a senior pastor of a church, uh, we had a man uh, that I had to confront for voyeurism with his adopted daughter. Mm. And uh, it was painful. I, you know, I went over to this house, the poor guy was on his knees and crying and everything else, and I thought I had accomplished everything I had. But I found out later, it, it wasn't just voyeurism. I didn't know that at the time. He actually apparently had sexually violated her. But I never, I didn't know that. Mm. And uh, I, at this conference, somebody walked in, you know, supporting her to confront me mm. for not mm. having helped her like I should have at that time. And, uh, and she would, this friend was taking her around to everybody who who was somehow involved in the church or her family, and it was all their fault, and somehow this is going to solve the problem for them. And I had to tell her so-called friend, I said, you are not helping her. I know you want justice, I said, but truth of the matter is, you didn't even hear my side of the story. I had no knowledge that that even happened to her. And if it happened to her, I would have, you know, probably turned everybody in and everything else. And, sure. and uh, so... It, it's a sad thing, but if you think you can go around and somehow exact justice out of everybody, you better leave that to God, <coughs> folks, because you can't do it. And you're probably going to get the same reaction that I did. I just felt sorry for her. I offered a free chance to come to our conference. I said, we help people like you. If you come to this thing, I promise you, if you process like, like I say, you're going to walk out of here free. Yeah. Of course, she didn't come because she didn't get her pound of flesh, I suppose. I don't know, but I felt really bad about that. Well, it turns, the unforgiveness turns into bitterness. Oh, it does. And that just rots, like cancer, just rots your bones. Rots the soul. And, uh, and one of the problems that we have, and we're kind of coming to the end of this, uh, but is, is that, it, to me, it, 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 and for a lot of people in their mind, the unfairness, the injustice of the whole situation uh, just kind of reeks with people. And they feel somewhat obligated to keep the, the wound kind of fresh, you know, and hoping that person will maybe someday, you know, come back and say they're sorry or come back and say, you know, I did it or I was wrong. But listen for a moment. What if they never do? Right. You're going to keep the wound open and, uh, and, and let that struggle all of your life? Folks, I have, <coughs> for the last 30 years of my life, I mean, I, I have sat with hundreds and hundreds of people, I have no idea how many, and, and saw them pray and ask the Lord who they need to forgive. 95% of the time, uh, it's going to be mom and dad. And mm -hmm. Not that they're the worst pre people in the world, but they were the significant others in their life or, or immediate family. We'll occupy usually the, in, uh, the, the first five names that come out of it. Uh, but there are other really atrocious things that happen to people. And as we explain forgiveness, and they have the list in front of them, and, and I put a little caption up that I, I forgive and put in the name, and what did they do, and how did it make you feel, and, and, uh, and they look at that list, and, and it's painful, folks. And I've seen some push it away and pull it back, you know, because it is a crisis of the will. It is. I'm agreeing to live with the consequences of that person's sin, and I'm not going to seek revenge. And I'm going to let God do that. Mm -hmm. Now, let me point out something, folks. That doesn't mean you don't testify in a court of law for, you know, civil problems like that. Sure. I mean, that still may happen. But my hope would be is that you forgave first and then went and testified so that you aren't going as a bitter, vengeful person. And so how do you get out of it? How do I say victim no more? I said, you let God deal with that person and get on with your life. Jesus came to heal the wounds of the brokenhearted. And I've seen people work through this painfully sometimes, just sometimes in a flood of tears. Keep a box of hankies there for some people. Others are kind of stoic about it. But as they work through it, there is something in me, it's in you as well, 
that wants to and has said to hundreds of people, I'm so sorry mm -hmm. that happened to you. You didn't deserve that. I'm so sorry, young man, you never had a father who knew how to love you. Instead, they put you down and told you you'd never amount to anything and you never could live up to that expectation. I am so sorry, young lady, you never had a mother who built you up and instead put you down, jealous of you, whatever your problem was. That's painful, folks. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I, I really think what I've seen over the years that just perpetuates that anger on the generation are, are the sexual sins that we see around us. And I can't tell you how many, it's not just women, it's men as, as well who have been sexually abused. Mm -hmm. and, and almost across the board, they are not voluntarily going to come back and say, I'm sorry, uh, or own up to it, or seek your forgiveness. And you just feel stuck. You just feel like, how can I let this go? I've right been, life, I've yeah. been violated. Right. And, um, and so let me just say to you what I've said to hundreds and hundreds of people. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that happened to you. I'm sorry, young man, that your dad didn't know how to hug you and to hold you and, and encourage you and show you true masculinity under the grace of God. Right. I'm so sorry that people listening right now have been rejected because of the color of their skin. I mean, racism is a horrible thing. I mean, God created them that way. How can you violate somebody else simply because they have a different color, a different background, or whatever? And the hardest one for me over the years, though, has been uh, the ladies who have been sexually abused. And, you know, it's disproportionate. It happens to men, too, but it's disproportionate. And, and those men probably will never come back. And so, ladies, as a husband, as a man, as a father, let me just say to this. Would you forgive us, men, for the way we've looked at you and touched you and raped you? That's our sickness. That is not your fault. You did not deserve that. And for your sake, let it go. Let God deal with that person. I know you want justice now, but you may not get it. But what you can have right now is mercy and grace. And, peace. and God wants to give that to you. Let him wrap your arms around you and let it go. For your sake, please, God, let yes. it go. Give him the grace to do that. This is not something I don't think we can do ourselves. I think we have to be enabled by God himself. The Spirit of God will help you work through this process. Take it to the cross. There's where the ground is level. And we all stand at the foot of it, not one better than another person. We've all been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. It's God alone who will set you free. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your prayerful support of Freedom in Christ Ministries. All of our content is made possible by you. Your generous support and financial gifts make these videos and our ministry possible. For more information on how to support our ministry, please visit www.freedominchrist.org and click Get Involved.